Well, there's this, this classic dream that almost all of us have at some point or another. Pastors and church planters, we definitely have this dream where we've made all the preparations for like launch Sunday at Island Creek Elementary School or for Christmas at the barn at Knoll's Produce, but no one got the word out and no one shows up. Actors have this dream where they've just been, been thrust on stage, but they have no idea what their lines are. Students have this dream where they walk into the classroom to take an important exam and suddenly they realize that they haven't been to a single class that year. Teachers have this dream where they're, they're stuck in a classroom teaching geography or some subject like that, but they know nothing at all about geography. Honestly, this kind of dream haunted me more when I was a teacher than, than when, um, since I've become a pastor. Teaching is this whole other level of hard. Even those who claim teachers have it easy with their apparently long holiday breaks and, and short work days are secretly in awe of those who day after day go into the classroom and confront head on our, our general confusion and disagreement over what the goal of, of, of teaching and learning even is. Today's scripture in, in the Gospel of John, did you, did you hear it? As it was read this morning, it's this prayer pinned from the desk of our greatest teacher, Jesus. It's this prayer offered up from, from the heart of our teacher, Jesus, to the Father at this crucial transition point at the end of his ministry among us. A transition point much like today. Jesus, the one who has excited us, who has guided us, who has taught us and, and, and coached us, now stands before God with, with this prayer. Father, I have taught them everything about you, everything about your kingdom. They know I am from you and they believe that you sent me just as I am sending them. But Father, even with this knowledge that they hold fast to, I pray that you would guard them from the evil one, that not one of them would forget or, or forsake this teaching. Protect them, God, from the evil one and, and ground them in the truth of the gospel. Throughout the season of Lent, I know that uh, you all, Aldersgate, have been centering your teaching and, and your hearts around the discipline of prayer. At, at Kingstown, we, this Lent, are, are wrestling with and reflecting on Jesus' gospel encounters with and references to, to Satan, Satan, the evil one. And well, in this passage today, both worlds collide. Jesus, who after confronting Satan in the wilderness emerges to become our, our greatest teacher, prays today that we, his students, his disciples, his, his followers may be protected from the evil one, who would have us forget Jesus' teaching, who would have us forget all that we have learned up until now, even in the midst of all we have to celebrate today, which is so much, Jesus knows how easy it is to forget that which has formed us and brought us this far. That's what makes teaching so hard, right? And our tendency to forget all that we have been taught is often rooted in, in this confusion over what our teaching has, has been for. What, what is this learning, this formation, this growing? What has it been about? Since Jesus, our, our teacher, emerged from meeting Satan in, in the wilderness, he has been giving us an education. In the world of education, one side of, of the spectrum says that, that education is really just a means of drawing out of us what's already there plunging the depths, those wondrous depths of us, to bring that knowledge up to the surface, 
And then, and then on the other side, we, we get uh, the other extreme that we are all just blank slates. And it's the job of the teacher, a good teacher, to transfer as much information onto a blank slate. On us, the blank slate is possible. And in between these lie other similar yet subtly different notions of, of, of training where we are equipped with skills to adapt to new circumstances with confidence or, or formation where, where through setback and, and disappointment and failure, our, our character is, is honed and chiseled in, in wisdom over time. And even though sometimes these contradict one another, all of these, the, the finding of what is already there and that hidden depth of us, the filling of the blank slate, the, the training and the forming and the chiseling, all are a part of this imagination of education. But it's, it's my sense that that is not what, what draws teachers to this profession. It's not what makes Jesus the best teacher we could ever ask for. Instead, it, it's, it's more this image of giving a student, a, a disciple, a follower, a key that unlocks a whole new universe beyond and within and beneath the standard everyday world that we would otherwise perceive. This is what the disciples felt when they were in the presence of Jesus. From the moment he, he emerged from the wilderness, this is the kind of education Jesus offered those who would seek and listen and follow. This is what, what we've been given this key to the kingdom, this thrilling, irresistible sense that this is what life is, this is what the world is, this is who I am, this is who God is. To be a teacher like Jesus is to be a disciple of the living God who makes disciples, is to be, to be called to give people that thrilling, irresistible key to the kingdom that is beyond and within and beneath what we could otherwise perceive. But how do we go about giving that key to people? This is the stuff of like virtual teacher workshops and in services. This is the stuff of church plant boot camps and conferences on starting new faith communities and visioning teams and leadership retreats and the latest research and most compelling writings from the best church growth experts on how to reach the community and how to grow the church and how to build small groups and how to multiply our impact and how to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. This is the question we've been asking for the last six years. How do we give away this key? And there are always all kinds of theories, right? all kinds of theories and formulas for how to engage students, how to teach the material, how to form them for college, how to, to, to send them off as informed, contributing members of society. There are all kinds of theories and formulas for the best way to plant a church, as Aldersgate has done with Kingstown, that will engage the unchurched and the disconnected, that will share the good news of God's love, that will form dedicated disciples, and eventually stand in compelling ministry and mission on their own in their community. There are all sorts of theories and formula and how-tos and best-kept secrets and best practices on how to go about giving people this key to the knowledge of the kingdom. First, you start with the folks who are new to the subject, right? Or to the class, new to faith, new to following Jesus, and like Jesus, you guide and you direct them and you give them vocabulary and meaning and purpose and roles to play in the unveiling of this new way to perceive the world or perceive the church or perceive God's love for them. This is what Jesus does at the start of the Gospels. He offers a whole lot of guiding a whole lot of directing. He offers the Beatitudes. He, he describes the kingdom of God for them. He teaches in parables. He heals people as tangible signs of heaven on earth. 
And his confused and oftentimes foolish disciples start to get the message. After this, as these folks become invested in this new way of life, this new way to perceive the world and the church, you, like Jesus, you begin to coach them and to encourage them to contribute to their ideas. You listen to them, you advise them, you inspire them, you set an example for them. And Jesus coaches his disciples and he, he prods them out of their comfort zones, sends them on assignments and on missions trips and with messages equipping them to take risks and advising them on the journey and debriefing with them afterwards. And then when, when the learning gets particularly difficult, when the growing gets hard and the going gets even harder, and, and interest begins to wane, key leaders fall away, as, as it presses against all that clogs up the keyhole, you, like Jesus, you get inside their motivations and build confidence through praise and through persuasion and through hope and by painting the picture of a future that is beyond what they can perceive. And finally, when their competence for the mission seems to match their eagerness to learn and share their knowledge of, of their faith, of the good news. You, like Jesus, in mentoring and decision-making and encouraging, send them to leave and fly the nest. This is why Jesus' prayer in John 17 is perfect for today. Jesus' prayer is a sending prayer. He, he, he steps aside, or, or in this case, he steps above and he leaves the disciples to carry on the embodiment and the proclamation of the gospel, guiding and coaching and supporting and sending. It's the shape of great teaching, the best practices from the best workshops on how to give the key to the kingdom. It's the theory and the formula of Jesus, our great teacher, and if you think about the people in your life who have been the best teachers. Chances are they led you in these ways in guiding and in coaching and in supporting and in sending you out. You also know, though, what it feels like to be thrown into, into the deep, into the deep end too quickly, to be set up to fail, to be propelled, to fly before ready, just haphazardly sending out without guiding and, and coaching and supporting. But Jesus, from the beginning of his ministry with us, he emerges from the wilderness and offers us the education we've been longing for. A ministry antithetical to the evil with which he just met. Jesus has the words of eternal life. He gives us, his disciples, the keys to the kingdom, opening up a whole new world we have not yet perceived and enabling us to discover through him what life is and what the world is and who we are and who God is. But in today's text, Jesus isn't teaching any longer. He's praying. The chalkboard has been erased now. <laughs> He's signed off line. He's alone in the classroom. And today, in the quietness of the classroom, our greatest teacher pins this prayer. Father, I have taught them everything about you and your kingdom. They know I am from you, and they believe that you sent me just as I am sending them. But I am no longer with them. They are now to do the things that I have done. And as they go, protect them, God. Protect them, Father, from the evil one. This prayer is not an, a hallmark prayer of the season of Lent. 
It's not this, this penitential prayer before Jesus takes up his cross. It, it doesn't anticipate the new life that is to come after the cross as the resurrection has already been realized among them. No, today the, the teacher is absent from them leaving them to do the work of God that is theirs now to do. And for Jesus' disciples, this really is the most remarkable day. Today is the most remarkable day, Aldersgate. Today is the most remarkable day, Kingstown. For Jesus' disciples, this really is the most remarkable day, and it's also the scariest day. The disciples feel the panic of of turning the next page in the story only to find a blank page that seems to read, you're on your own now. And they look to their left and they look to their right and they're wondering how in the world they're going to manage to know and find the key to the kingdom on their own. There is so much to celebrate Jesus, not daunted by the depth of their sin or the prison of death, has raised them up to new life at Easter, sending them out to be the church as he always spoke them to be. But in their hearts and in their guts, they're beside themselves. The teacher is gone. And they feel like like the actor on stage who never learned their lines or the student at the exam who who never went to any lessons, or the teacher in front of the class who never learned the subject. But deeper than that, even if they could remember what to do, it's not the same as having Jesus here. Jesus didn't come to to bring a message. Jesus was the message. God with us. Jesus didn't come to give a key. Jesus was the key to the kingdom, to new life to the answer to what life is and who we are and who God is. The the disciples weren't inspired by an idea. They were transformed by a person. And now he's gone. And they miss him with this ache so so deep, it's, it's paralyzing. A yearning so profound, it's it's transfixing. A longing so overwhelming, it obliterates all rational thought. And suddenly, Jesus' prayer, it, it makes total sense. It's this prayer that moves beyond the greatest of teaching. It's something so much more than we can be given in church planting boot camps and best practice manuals. It's a stage beyond the guiding and the coaching and the supporting and the sending. It's a dimension that no other form of learning or formation can come anywhere near. Jesus prays that God would protect us from the evil one. And what would the evil one have us forget? That when Jesus sends us, The Spirit always goes with. And and the Spirit is the difference between what's possible through our best striving and planting and, and learning and building and growing and sustaining Kingstown. And what's made possible by God's grace and gift alone. Sitting down to pray this Lent, our great teacher wonders how to get through to us. 
the God who holds the keys to the whole, this whole new universe, to the kingdom beyond what we can perceive. This God prays for us aching and longing and yearning that we might not forget all that Jesus has been teaching us all along. That the, that the true meaning of this education that Jesus has been giving us since the beginning of his ministry is not plunging our inner hidden parts or having our blank slates etched upon or being trained for adapting well in the missional environment or being formed by the disappointments we've had over the last six years for greater wisdom on the journey. The true meaning of this education is and has always been conversion. Conversion that brings us to the moment when we come face to face with God and find not the theories and formulas of a great teacher, but a pining and an aching and a longing and a yearning heart seeking to be with us now and always and willing to go to any lengths to make that so. And the names of those greatest links are Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus sending us out with God's Spirit, which is simply grace and gift alone. I offer this to you in the name of God the Father, in the name of Christ his Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.